are coincidences the opposite of randomness, or are they a naturally occurring part of chaos? A computer scientist weighs in on Dirk Gently's holistic detective agency. Ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Today, we're going to look at Dirk Gently's holistic detective agency and the complexities of randomness. Joining me is Professor Dotis of the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences at NYU. Welcome, Evgeny. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Dirk Gently is the brainchild of the late Douglas Adams, who, with the publication of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, dragged science fiction into the age of Monty Python. Adams was a writer for Doctor Who, and the first threads of Dirk Gently can be seen in the City of Death serial from the 17th season of Doctor Who, which had the best Doctor Who of all times. Please write in and tell me I'm wrong. There have been novels and serials of Dirk Gently, and their latest iteration features Elijah Wood and Samuel Barnett. Are now a vital part of the investigation. Dirk Gently is a detective who believes everything is interconnected and therefore Randomness is meaningful, and following the patterns of randomness will cause him to solve the case. Our guest is an expert in randomness, which is really a funny phrase that could just as easily apply to a surfer as to a wildly successful cryptologist. Evgeny, a surfer might see randomness as a dangerous, bad, unpredictable thing, but for computer scientists, randomness is, is valuable. Why is it valuable? You're absolutely right, Lisa. Um, in cryptography, uh, we really need randomness and we cannot live without it. Uh, just to understand it a little bit better, let me remind you what cryptography is very briefly. And in basic terms, cryptography is uh, the science of how to protect sensitive information from unauthorized access. Um, and one way to protect it, which is one of the most basic things that I teach in my first class on cryptography, is this concept called encryption, where we take the data, which is supposedly have some secret information, and we scramble it in a way that nobody can understand what the data is. And when I use the word scrambled, implicitly, I'm already starting to talk about randomness, because intuitively, the scrambling is kind of very fixed, um, and everybody knows kind of what it is. It's very hard to hide this information. So the way we technically do it, we generate what we call a cryptographic key, which is essentially a sequence of kind of random digits or random letters or something like that. And then we use that key to scramble the sensitive data to create what we call a ciphertext. And intuitively, our objective is to make sure that the ciphertext looks nothing like the original plain text, like the original message. And in other words, it's kind of random. So in some sense, it's already inherent in even the definition of a secret that the secret has to be random. And in order to scramble things, we need randomness. And in fact, we can even formally show it that any way we want to securely encrypt data, if the data has to be like really secure, we really need randomness. So it's completely essential for what we do. Okay, so, so for us to understand randomness, is, is randomness a set state? Is there, is there a range of randomness? And, and what's on the other side of randomness? That's a very good question. So randomness is definitely a scale. So there are two extremes of randomness. At the one end, there is a world that we as cryptographers don't want to live in, which is a world where everything is determined. There is kind of no randomness. Everything is kind of known in advance. So in this sense, there is kind of no secret. There is nothing we can do as cryptography. Everybody knows everything. So this is a world of uh, kind of no entropy, uh, no randomness, which is kind of bad for security. On the other end, there is a world where we have what we call true randomness. And the easiest way to explain what true randomness is, is imagine somebody has a perfect coin, unbiased coin, heads and tail. And I just want like a decision, yes or no, which we call 0 and 1. Um, in computer science. So I just want to flip a perfect coin. And if the coin is indeed unbiased, I will flip it and I get what we call a random bit, something which is 50-50, 0 or 1. And if I want more bits, I will kind of flip it again, completely independently from the previous flip. And if I keep doing it, I get what we call a sequence of perfect and independent unbiased random bits, which we also call true randomness, and which is a gold standard of um, randomness, but in reality, unfortunately, things happen to be in between. 
in the real world, we don't have somebody kind of nice kind of standing and flipping <laughs> these infinite coins. We need to get it from somewhere else. And these are called what we call entropy sources, which are some um, either provable or heuristic sources which we believe are unpredictable and are good sources of what we call entropy. Uh, like, for example, for simplistic example, in the real uh, world, if you want to say, okay, maybe whether it's going to rain tomorrow, we don't know. Maybe it's going to rain, maybe it's not going to rain. So we can use this uh, you know, event as a random bit. So tomorrow we'll find out whether it's going to rain or not, and we get a bit. Maybe the, next, the day after tomorrow, we, are not, we cannot predict them for sure with probability 100%, but we have some kind of randomness in them, but it's not perfect. So such sources are called imperfect random sources. But over time, doesn't the randomness of that coin flip lose its, valuable because, lose its value because it, it doesn't become predictive. You don't know what the actual coin flip is, but overall, you know it's going to be about 50-50 on the number of coins. So does randomness lose its value as it repeats? Well, you reached actually a very deep philosophical point that <laughs> actually the um, entropy of something or the randomness and something really changes over time. So this kind of happens all the time in cryptography that the more information you have, things kind of lose randomness. And in early days of uh, encryption and computer security and all those kind of espionage stories, people somewhat correctly realize that it's very hard to keep using the same randomness to encrypt more and more data because the randomness loses its value as you encrypt more and more stuff. Uh, and also there is a possibility that maybe your key could leak and, and so on. So that's why it was very imperative to doing secure encryption to generate vast amount of randomness which kind of never repeats and you only use it once for every message. But that, of course, traded one problem for another. It became so hard to do this that people invariably made mistakes. And there are several very high-profile stories about it. The most famous is the Enigma machine that was covered it's here uh, in the show, the story of um, Alan Turing in imitation games, which is exactly, and the irony is people love the fact that this Enigma machine used since World War II was broken. But to be honest, they were a little bit lucky. If the Germans actually used, did what they were supposed to do, if they really followed the prescribed um, instructions, they didn't cut corners and reuse certain right. random values multiple times, unfortunately, the <laughs> World War II might have been two years longer than it was, and Alan Turing would have never broken it. But fortunately for us, uh, Germans kind of cut some corners because it was very hard not to reuse this randomness, and it was hard to generate good randomness, and so on. So they made this mistake, and therefore we won the World War II <laughs> two years right. uh, earlier than we had. And in general, the problem for keeping secrets for a long time is a really, really hard problem. And even in our modern days, when we use modern kind of text, secure text messaging applications like WhatsApp um, or Signal or Facebook Messenger and so on, even those applications very aggressively change their cryptographic keys um, pretty quickly over time, exactly because they're afraid that the randomness would become less random. Are cryptologists really good at picking lottery numbers? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I wish it was the case. Um, essentially, the only advantage that we would have is that we wouldn't trust ourselves, that we would like <laughs> flip, uh, you know, pick a random lottery number using a computer as, uh, as opposed to ourselves. <laughs> Even though if it's a good lottery, it shouldn't really matter. Good tip, good tip. One of the key things for lotteries, for the public to believe in lottery, is that lottery should actually, you're asking me how the users pick lottery numbers to win, but actually the real question is how to make sure that lotteries uh, pick really random numbers and right. don't cheat you. And there was really recently a high profile case uh, listed in the New Yorker when the programmer working for the lottery system, he inserted his own, what we call a backdoor in the code of generating random numbers, where under some certain conditions, very cleverly triggered and infrequently triggered, he would know the winning lottery numbers in advance, but to the rest of the world, because they didn't really, couldn't really, the, the code was so complex, they couldn't really see this backdoor, to the rest of the world it looked kind of okay, and then he and his family kind of, you know, infrequently, not to raise suspicions, really? would kind of claim those lottery, and that was like a genius lot, and the irony is you would think, how did people actually catch this guy? Uh, did he really do a bad job? And he didn't actually do perfect job. If he used some of the tools that we <laughs> developed, he would be able to do it even better. But actually, one of the, unfortunately for us, even one of the things that got him caught is one of his relatives just, you know, got drunk and like gave it away or something like that. And that's kind of brought the suspicion to him. Uh. But it's definitely, even in this kind of example of the lottery, it's really imperative, forget about users, that yeah. people who <laughs> right, run the lottery right, right. actually don't cheat the public.
Right, right, right. And if you're going to have a secret, keep a secret. Yes, absolutely. Yes, <laughs> keeping secret a secret is kind of imperative, but it's like a really hard problem. Yeah. Video games are an interesting example of the variations of digital randomness. What a game company might call a randomly generated level is often just a procedurally generated environment with more of a mix and match flair, which extends the variation, but not forever, a problem that was driven home by the early release of No Man's Sky. In the digital world, randomness is a valued commodity, and while some websites will give away pseudo-randomness, true randomness needs to be paid for. What is true randomness? How is it created and why is it a commodity? Yeah, that's an excellent question and this is a really hard question. A lot of my research is exactly about right. this question. So, so the easy part is what is true randomness? I just told you, somebody just going and flipping this random bits. Of course, we don't have this person. So what we need to do, we need to take some of the sources of randomness that we see in the real world. I don't know, it could be timing of interrupts, temperature of the processor, I don't know, weather, you name it, uh, and somehow convert it to the sequence of independent and unbiased random flips. And this is a very non-trivial process, um, and there is a special name for it, it's called random number generation, and building a good random number generator is actually very hard. This is one of the things that, um, that I do in my work, but just to give you a toy example, which is not anything close to the real life, imagine I want to flip just one coin. Right. But you know, in these days, nobody carries coins, only credit cards, so I don't have a coin. So <laughs> what do I do? Maybe I'll ask uh, my Facebook friends, for simply let's say there are thousands of them, and just ask them, say, hey, give me a random bit. Right. You know, flip a coin for me. And I get thousand responses. And now I would like to kind of convert those thousand responses to one bit. Well, of course, if my friends all really give me a random bit, I can just take the very first bit and I'm done. But let's say, I don't know, I, I think some of them are like lazy, they just like for fun say zero or one without really flipping a coin, maybe just like me, they don't have a coin. So maybe I can like assume, I don't know, like a hundred of them were really honest flipped a coin and gave me a true random bit, but I don't know which hundred of, of them did it. So can I still, I get the thousand bits, hundred of them are random, the other 900 is garbage, essentially. How can I get a random bit out of it? And in this particular toy example, you know, there is a simple solution. I will just count the number of zeros that I get from my friends. If it's even, I will just output zero myself. If it's odd, I will output one. And in this two example, you can actually see that even as, as long as one person gives, gave me a true, truly random bit, really heads and tells this probability 50-50, even if the others completely lied about it and just give me deterministic answers, the resulting bit that I get is random. I mean, it's a kind of a toy exercise to see it, but this is an example of a very unrealistically simple, in a sense that real world is not as simple as this, uh, example of what we call a randomness extractor, a procedure that takes something imperfect, so I have like a thousand bit, a you know, a thousand answers and only hundred of them random, but I don't know where it is. This is the beauty of randomness, and I get one truly random bit out of it. So, and more generally, this random number generator, they take it on a much more extreme level and they give you a lot of random bits, very good, you know, really nearly random bits, as long, you know, and they extract everything they can from this highly regular uh, sources of randomness in the real world. But they have to find, they can't, they can't generate it, like you can't hit a string of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 on, you, you, you're on your computer. You have to go outside to find you said temperature fluctuations right. and, and, and audio, audio fluctuations? Exactly. Well, so, so in, a, in different computer systems, they use different, uh, different sources. Very popular sources are some physical sources. For example, every computer has some kind of processor and has some, something called an operating system. And in this operating system, there are these atomic instructions, read from disk, write from disk. So every time there are a lot of programs run on the computer. So, and whenever a program does something kind of very basic, it's it's called, it triggers what is called a computer interrupt, and it's very hard to predict exact sequence of those interrupts. So the timing of those interrupts, this exact nanoseconds when a particular program called a particular event, it's like nobody, we believe that nobody can predict them. They're not truly random, we can maybe predict as an exact second, we know roughly speaking it will happen here, but the exact nanosecond, no. So this is an example of a very popular entropy source, but hardly the only one. All kinds of things, if you have a good random number generator, it actually has this uh, thing that the more sources, the better. It takes entropy from everywhere. It should accumulate all the entropy without a priori knowing where it comes from, but as long as it passes through the system, you should kind of get it and give me something which is really random. So, so let's talk about entropy. 
The primary scientific definition of entropy is the measurement of the unavailability of a system's thermal energy for conversion into mechanical work. For the rest of us, it's a measurement of how quickly chaos settles back into the apartment after the cleaning people leave. In computer science, entropy is a very valuable force. Why? In uh, cryptography, entropy is extremely valuable. It's like the air we breathe. Without entropy, we cannot do anything. But is that a philosophical idea or a mathematical a mathematical value? I think it's both. That's a, a, another uh, fantastic question in a sense that, as I told you on the example of random number generators, there are kind of two parts of any random number generator. One part is to kind of understand how much entropy does my, or how much randomness is there in whatever source of entropy I'm using. And that, I believe, is largely kind of an impossible and very philosophical task. It goes back to maybe like Descartes, I think, therefore I am which is this mechanistic versus mentalistic view of life, usually it's kind of described, do we have free will or is everything predetermined? But if you think about it, what does really free will means? Well, it's the opposite of everything is predetermined. So if everything is not predetermined, it means that there should be some entropy, there should be there is some chaos, some randomness, something that you cannot predict a priori. So essentially, free will means that there is randomness in the real world. And, uh, but we cannot settle this debate still goes for years. <laughs> there are scientists believe this as other. But what makes it fun for me is that for my research, I actually don't have to answer this question. <laughs> well, uh, well, you know, essentially I'm in trouble if somebody proves that everything is deterministic, then I'm out of the job. But essentially, short of somebody proving it, which is, you know, it's almost like a religion. You just have to kind of make assumptions. Mm -hmm. There is a very beautiful science that can be done saying, listen, if there is entropy, what is the best way to manipulate it? What is the best way to convert it to, to true randomness? What is the best way then to use this true randomness in cryptography so that you have very efficient system, practical system, usable system, not like these systems used in the World War II, where essentially there was a secure system, but it required so much randomness somehow, and the randomness has to be coordinated in such inconvenient ways that eventually the system was broken. So there is a lot of really excitement in doing cryptography, right? independently of whether we solve this philosophical question whether entropy and randomness exists. Some of the terms used to describe elements of Evgeny's work sound like that very special kind of poetry that comes from refrigerator magnets. So we here at Science Goes to the Movies have made a refrigerator magnet poem from one of the concepts. Public perfect randomness has value, like imperfect secret randomness measured in entropy loss. <laughs> uh, what does that collection of words mean? Uh, well, first of all, I have to say I'm like very impressed, so I should actually maybe use it in some of my classes. <laughs> I should put it on my own refrigerator. <laughs> this is definitely a, um, a great idea. Um, so in this particular case, I think um, you extracted, I would say you extracted two kind of subtle messages uh, which are um, present in, in uh, uh, several of my works. So the first message is, as I told you, what we would like to get, we would like to get the secret keys, and those secret keys have to be truly random. And so we need like this secret randomness. Well, in reality, heuristically, philosophically, or whatever, we get um, secret imperfect randomness. So we need to convert secret imperfect randomness to secret perfect randomness. And it turns out that one thing that would really help, you can do it maybe otherwise, but one thing which really dramatically helps to improve this process is the availability of public perfect randomness. So if there is something which is not secret, but was generated truly randomly, or maybe somehow became public, so it's not, I can no longer use it as my key because everybody knows it, but as long as it was originally generated um, you know, very well, I can combine it with my secret imperfect randomness and get the best of both worlds and gets secret perfect randomness. So this is like, looks maybe a little bit as an oxymoron, but essentially uh, public randomness, even you know, just the fact that there is something random, even though it's not secret, is kind of helpful for cryptography. This is maybe the it's first message. It's helpful to remember your password. You take something that's publicly there on the website and then you add your random code to it. it makes it. Uh, so that could be one way, and indeed actually technically so. Yeah, that's actually, somewhat more or less uh, similar to what you said. So it's, it's some who, it helps you to scramble your password in a way that makes it less predictable. Yeah, that's exactly one, you know, the first half of this poem and all oh, the refrigerator <laughs> poem. Uh, and the second part is more kind of in quantitative um, terms. So what is the entropy loss? So it turns out the entropy, I told you, it's a measure of randomness in the system. For example, in, um, this case where I need like 
my friends to help me flip um, a random coin, and I had 1,000 friends, and but only 100 of them flipped a coin, it means that I got something which has 100 bits of entropy. And you have lazy friends. I have lazy friends, mm -hmm. but uh, you know what's even worse, I, I was some who kind of inefficient. I only extracted one bit. I get 100 bits of entropy, but I only extracted one. So you can ask the question, well, can you extract all 100? Well, that turns out to be actually very ambitious because I don't know where those 100 bits are. Um, and it turns out inevitably I have to lose something. And it's actually tricky in this case even to extract two bits or more than two bits. But in general, we can ask the question, what is the largest number of bits? How close to the entropy can I get? Can I extract 80 bits, 90 bits, 70? What is the right answer? And the entropy loss is exactly what I lost. So if I extracted 90 bits, it means that I lost 10 bits. And the reason it's important, because entropy is such a scarce resource. As I told you, it's hard to generate entropy. It's hard to generate randomness. So ideally, when we convert this imperfect entropy into randomness, we want to minimize entropy loss. We want to extract almost everything. And using some of the work of myself and others, by now for many applications, we can actually provably extract almost all entropy in the system. And when, it, when we can't, we can show that there is nothing we can do. We are essentially optimal. But let's talk about one of the human elements of randomness. Let's talk about coincidences. One of the many strange pieces of technology in Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the infinite probability drive, which fuels the starship Heart of Gold. Adams based the drive on a warping of a real-world quantum theory, which states that there is an infinitesimally small probability that a subatomic particle will be found very far from its point of origin. Adams himself described the infinite probability drive as a plot contrivance machine. And in fact, when the characters Arthur Dent and Ford Prefect come in contact with the drive, extraordinary coincidences abound. And we humans, we love our extraordinary coincidences. We love patterns. And we really, really, really want our coincidences to be meaningful, even magical. But outside the fabulous fictions, are coincidences meaningful? Are coincidences the opposite of randomness? Or are coincidences just a part of the chaos? Well, that's a, another very good question, a highly philosophical question. So there is um, a little bit of both. So um, to a large extent, and this is what I believe is, um, coincidences is just part of life. And many of the coincidences cannot be predicted. It just kind of happens. There is nothing wrong or right we did to like win the lottery or lose a large amount of money on the stock market. It's just uh, one of those um, kind of events. Um, uh, but of course, having said this, um, uh, some things we can control. Um, you know, there is this saying, um, the harder I work, the lucky I get, or luck is where preparation meets opportunity, or chance favors a prepared mind. So these things essentially kind of say in certain situations, we can actually work towards you know, surprising, uh, but you know, highly pleasant situations. We can partially control um, uh, reality. But unfortunately, in many, many situations, there is, I believe there is randomness and chaos that is beyond us. And one of the explanations to this, you know, but you can say, wait a second, but you know, if there is chaos and you cannot really predict anything, how come coincidences really happen? And the answer is, comes from, uh, actually there is a theory for it, uh, but it's very well mathematically explained. It's called improbability theory, which essentially say, states that uh, Coincidences are bound to happen. They will happen every day, and a lot of them actually happened. Unlikely coincidences. And the explanation is actually very simple, because a vast majority of hypothetical, very unlikely events that could happen never actually happen. We just don't notice. So if I bump into somebody I haven't seen for 20 years in an unexpected place, I say, wow, what a coincidence. Who could have expected it? But for the rest of the year, I don't bump into somebody. And I don't like stop every second and say, oh, I didn't bump into this person. I didn't bump into this person. Right. And so on. So there are like so many random events that could happen that don't happen that eventually some of those rare events happen. Like, let me give you a simple example of the lottery that you mentioned. Assume there is a lottery with like a million tickets, and there is one ticket will be a winning number. You sure, you know, somebody put a winning number. And let's say they're all sold out, all the million tickets are sold, and I bought one of those things. So what are the odds of me winning the lottery? Well, probably it will be like a huge coincidence, and I win the lottery one in a million. I would be super lucky, and I'll say, what a coincidence, um, fantastic thing. But in the grand scheme of things, 
well, you know all the tickets are sold out. You know there is one winning number unless somebody cheated. So you know somebody is going to win the lottery. So for that somebody, that highly unlikely, fantastic right. event kind of happened. So overall, this improbability theory says that there are so many events that even some of the unlikely things happen, we should right. expect them. The trick which makes it kind of interesting is we cannot predict in advance what those coincidences would right. be. And in movies, it's actually also very popular um, you know, movies always explore this kind of um, situations where, um, you know, like Dirk Gently, Holistic Detective Agency, everything looks random and in the end it kind of comes together. Well, I, I believe in real life uh, there are plenty of Chekhov guns, you know, plenty of things which are just there, like guns that never shoot or <laughs> it's just no coincidences happen. But in movies, I guess, uh, uh, it is much more interesting when everything kind of comes together right. and crazy plot. Right. Right. B becomes non crazy. Uh, but overall, I think, uh, as I said, it's something in between. There is chaos in life, there are things we cannot control. Um, it seems there, magical yeah. for the lottery winner. Yeah. Well, but there is also this thing which is also interesting, it's correlated called the black swan theory or black swan effect, where after such a coincidence happens, you try to assign some deep meaning right. to it. You can say, oh, it's like the reason I won the lottery because, right. I don't know, it's like I uh, woke up yesterday and I had a dream in my thing, or I, I don't know, whatever it is, people like assign some theories, and sometimes those theories might be correlated with reality. Right. Well, not in the lottery case, I hope, but in many cases, this is just, you know, bad or good luck that just happens. And this is one of the beauty of randomness. It's, uh, it gives us surprises. <laughs> thank you so much for spending time with us. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure.